I'm from Portland. Uh, originally, I was going to give this talk in May, I believe it was, at the API to Docs in-person conference. Clearly not in the cards here in 2020. Um, but I bet there are some of you uh, who are watching who wouldn't have been able to make it to Portland. So I'm glad that, uh, that you're able to, <laughs> to join here today and that's um, and that I can bring this message to you. So yeah, I mentioned Portland as, uh, as my hometown. It's actually an adopted hometown. And uh, so for those, those who have the chat nearby or tab over and drop into the chat your guess for what this fruit is. So I grew up in a farm, farm town of Northern California, uh, multiple generations growing, <laughs> growing this, uh, this fruit. And I promise this has to do with uh, <laughs> with machine readable developer experience as well. So, in preparation for this talk, uh, I read some old timey newspapers, as as you do, and I read about this mechanical shaking and harvesting device, and it happened to mention my grandfather as well, and. He had used and adapted many of these devices. So to be able to, to shake a tree, have the fruit drop, and then created this from a, from a walnut picker, <laughs> turned it into something that could kind of basically like a street sweeper go and collect this fruit. And this sentence here really jumped out at me as something that could be written today about many industries. Maybe instead of mechanization, we might say automation, but there's a lot of talk about, about how many industries are impacted. And uh, if you've read to the end here, you see that, uh, that prunes is the answer, and this is what they look like when they're ripe. And this is a more recent way of uh, automatically picking them. And this, you line up the tractor and and it kind of goes and I sort of sweeps them off, <laughs> off of the tree itself and into a bin. But I was thinking about, you know, even this, there's, there's at least one person involved with some skill. I don't know if I could line up a tractor. I grew up on a farm. I don't know if I could line up a tractor to make sure I didn't uh, take out any trees uh, as I did that. And so, uh, so really, the, the, what I'm seeing with this and what I'll talk about with machine readable developer experience is really taking the, the skills that the humans have and making sure that we make the best use of those. And all of us who are tech writers or, or tech inclined, we have skills that, uh, that I wanna make sure that we're putting in the right places. And so, I, I'm not usually one for starting off a talk with uh, dictionary definitions, but on the other hand, tech writers are word people and words do matter. So here, this is adapted from Don Norman's definition of user experience with developer in place there. And so we're really talking about all of these interactions and how can we make them better for that developer audience. And then machine readable, perhaps a, a little more self-explanatory, though I'm not sure Noah Webster knew what a computer was, uh, but certainly his dictionary uh, has defined it. And I'm gonna take these in that order of first talking about developer experience. And here it's, where is there room for machines? Where can we allow some into our kind of nuanced world of developer experience. And then certainly there is room in that machine readable world for us to be able to inject our skills. And so those two, which when coming together have what I've been calling human computer collaboration. And so I know many of you might be saying, ah, okay, so we're talking about open API which is an API description format, the most popular. And yes, and also 
other description formats and other ways of being able to uh, codify developer experience. And speaking of open API, I previously worked at Zapier and have been in the API space for a decade or more. And so often I would get asked, oh, you know what Zapier should do is take all of the open API descriptions and just import them and then look at that. There's a whole bunch more integrations on the, on the platform. Well, this is an example of Google Sheets on Zap, Zapier and you have a, a few different, you know, create a spreadsheet row and update a spreadsheet row down there. And the thing is, when you look at an open API description, you see lists of endpoints. And when you look at a Zapier integration, you see use cases. And those are not always a one-to-one. -one. If you dive into the Google Sheets documentation, I mean, this, the batch update, I believe, is what you would use uh, for sure to update the row, perhaps even to, to create it. And it's not a one-to-one -one with, with some of these other options here. They might not be in a Zapier integration at all. So understanding that there's not that direct connection between what a machine sees and what a user sees or a developer sees is an important concept to keep in your heads as we're talking about this machine readable developer experience and where where we can pull in machines and where we're more likely to be able to focus our skills. So certainly documentation is is an area. Ben talked about it in in his of making sure that it's updated and accurate. And I know Open API was one of the fields there in in the portal to be able to pull in. Certainly Swagger, which became Open API, what the first tooling for Swagger was around documentation. So this is an area probably we're familiar with, but being able to pull this in and make sure that it's always updated along with the uh, with the open API is a a part where we can we can help to improve that developer experience and there's a bunch of tools uh, at openapi.tools to be able to do that and some create client libraries from open API and other descriptions uh, I'm an advisor to API Matic who does that I met them on the first day of working at a company called Orchestrate, uh, where I ran developer relations, a small database as a service. Um, and everyone used Orchestrate via our five official client libraries. And so that became, I wish I could say that we adopted, <laughs> adopted and generated client libraries. Those were handmade, uh, each one of them. And I saw the pain of that when we announced a new feature to, to our database. I was at a conference in London. I worked sort of time shifting with, a, with an engineer who was, we wrote an announcement post together. He had some great examples in there. We published it. And somewhere in there, we realized that we could use a checklist like Ben had for when something be, is able to be released because we did not have support across all of our client libraries. And for our developers, and I think this is the case for most developers, your API is often experienced through those libraries. And so it was essentially like we didn't support this feature that we felt like, hey, this is our new feature, we have it. And so being able to get those new features in. And so you can see this client library matrix was sort of my response to that was like, we have to understand what we do and don't support. And you can see there's something going on there with paginate relations. So in addition to SDKs, you can help someone experience the API within the docs. I actually, I spoke at the very first write the docs in Portland about this and I compared it, I compared interactive documentation to basketball saying that, uh, that it used to be if you dribbled between your legs and behind your back, that that was showing off. But at some point it became standard, even at the lowest levels of competition, at least for a point guard. And I'm not sure we've reached that stage with 
trying an API within documentation, but we definitely have the technology to make that possible, to be able to go from an open API or other API description and create a framework like Dropbox has here with this API Explorer or some kind of try it functionality that is within your docs to be able to experience that API before you go out to, to the SDKs or to code to be able to use it. You can also, uh, a good experience, especially internally, but maybe for alpha testers is being able to try an API before it's coded. So taking that machine readable piece and creating mock servers, whether they're local or hosted somewhere to be able to collaborate with maybe someone working on the front end of, of a project or with a partner who is going to be the first developer user for a new API and being able to, to have a good experience even though you don't yet have an API. And again, that experience driven by having a way to describe and then generate these. And so for some of you that might, that might be some areas you're already exploring and I, I think there's just so much room in developer experience to be able to automate the pieces that, uh, that are repetitive so that we can focus in on some of the areas where we add the most, which I'll talk about in the next two sections here. And this first one is that there is a lot of room in, you know, we think of open API as this thing for computers, but there's actually a lot of room uh, for you to be able to get familiar with it, to first of all, use it. That's what that last section was about. If you, if you haven't played around with what you can generate from an open API, uh, I, I recommend trying it. Go in and, and make some edits to that file and then if you don't have a process to already have open APIs in your organization, create them yourself so that you can start to have something that you can use. And I, I want to say off the top, you know, no one, no one makes bad documentation on purpose. And these are several reasons I came up with for why bad docs get, uh, get made. Certainly all of us on, on, this call are looking to, to fight that fight and, and make great docs. This actually goes on for several pages uh, that didn't fit on my screen. You can go and find the, the Medium post that talks about uh, the reasons bad docs get made. But from a machine readable standpoint, one of the reasons that bad docs get made, and this is, for me, this is completely... I, I made this as bad as I as I could here by having those descriptions be uh, nearly useless of post pet put pet. Uh, but when you have generated documentation from open APIs that are that are bad in the human readable standpoint, you end up with bad docs mm -hmm. as well. And this is an open API description, but what I want to highlight here for you are all of the areas where there's a human readable aspect to it. So open API is absolutely machine readable and you can go through here and figure out the endpoints and what are the, the fields that it, that it expects and what does it respond with. But there's also plenty for people like us to be able to add that human side and make sure that what gets generated doesn't look like this. And um, in addition, I mean, if you look at, again, the, the best practices of documentation for APIs would say you want to have example responses. Well, you can, you can do that in open API. So on the left is just a, the standard, like these are the fields, but you can give each of those fields descriptions and give them names. And again, this is creating a better experience by 
injecting some some human skill into what is otherwise a machine description. And so I think I've I've hammered on this enough. You can see in the highlighted areas, it's not just a machine format. It is a human format and um and we can go in and and use that. And some of the things that we can also help make happen consistency within an API and across APIs, you can use a tool like Spectral, which is a linter for uh, JSON and YAML files, uh, and specifically open API and create rules so that you can make sure that all fields have camel case if that's what if that's what you use and you can look for those and find the inconsistencies the sort of stuff that that is important in developer experience and might not otherwise show up if you're just looking at is this documented does it does it meet sort of the the uh, the specification that we have uh, for the API but you can also do that. I mean, I think probably underlying in this conversation is how the heck does the description actually get updated? And hopefully that's part of an engineering process. But if it's not, you can make sure that what you have in your documentation, if your documentation is driven from this spec, matches the actual um, the actual API that's there, the API contract as uh, as some have called it, where where you look at what comes back and does it match the spec that you have. You might think that that's outside of sort of the tech uh, tech writing world, that that maybe belongs in engineering. And maybe you're right. Uh, and I don't want to say it's just a spectrum. And I know Ben talked a lot about, uh, about do tech writers need to know engineering? Do engineers need to know tech writing? And I think there is this, this uh, fuzzy spot, uh, fuzzy area here in the middle where adding a little bit of this technology, especially if your organization doesn't already have it, will make a better developer experience. So it's it behooves us who are helping to create that experience to make sure that it is accurate, that it uh, is consistent. And really, you've seen both of these are really about where are the parts where we can take advantage of the machine readable aspects and bring uh, the human aspects. So just a few more topics around developer experience, <clears throat> things that I look for. I should say, first of all, human computer collaboration, I thought, I, like, ooh, this is a great term. It turns out, uh, like, like everything, it's a term that's, <laughs> that has been used. And in Artificial intelligence, it really means taking taking an AI and treating it like a coworker. Uh, in other words, continually training it, not seeing it as something that you just use, but that you truly collaborate with. And I think we can kind of take that flavor as we look at some of the areas where I believe uh, tech writers should most focus for great experiences. Number one, a getting started guide is is the absolute best experience to make sure that someone gets started on the right on the right foot. And it's very nuanced. You're adding context, and that's where that's where humans are really needed. But then you can find ways to be able to codify that. Uh, I mean, at the very simplest, you have here a getting started guide that goes step by step, helps someone through. Well, of course, there is a GitHub repo behind that and a way to be able to deploy it automatically. I'm. It's a simple example, but I'm saying everywhere you look where you're adding the context, there's a way to be able to, to add some machine readable aspects. This is even clearer, I think, and a bigger opportunity in use cases. And so uh, here you have, again, going back to that Zapier example, there are a few things, these use cases that humans have in mind, 
but how can you turn those into something that's um, that remembers what that use case is? And I mean, certainly Zapier is an example. There are uh, there are Zapier integrations that that kind of codify this uh, this use case. But in our API world, the closest I've seen has been Postman collections that maybe there's a series of API calls that are required for to support a specific use case and being able to encapsulate those. And yes, you want to write about them in a human way, but is there a, a way that you can capture that and help someone uh, import that into, into their project. And a lot of what I spend my time on are thinking about developer problems and helping companies that wanna reach developers write about those problems so that uh, they can help people, they can educate and inspire people to solve them. And the reason that I look at it as the problem side <laughs> versus the solution is that humans are the ones who understand the problems. So you might, someone might say, yeah, patients are, are not showing up to their appointments. And when they do, they don't have all the documents they need. And of course, this pretty clearly could be a tutorial in your minds. Um, I feel like I've done a really good job on my nearly last slide to have finally only mentioned Twilio for the first time. It's a API talk joke from years back that's uh, the, the time to Twilio uh, slide. So it was a little later, I guess, Ben, sorry, I could have done Vonage to, uh, <laughs> to build this in. Uh, but here you have the context, but then also code that goes along to be able to uh, help someone with that actual solution. So here's the way it is, but you, you really can't talk about the solution without really showing you understand the problem. And so what I wanna leave you with here is first of all, look for the spots where you can take advantage of descriptions and to inject your skill into these, uh, these machine readable aspects. But then also think about how can you document more problems? So how can you get at those areas that really are innately human and pull that in to create a better and machine readable developer experience. So thanks so much for your time. And I think we do have uh, some question time.